Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm talking about an institution that clothes, feeds, and houses us, that employs us, that invests our savings. It's the source of immense growth and prosperity around the world. But it's also a cause of incredible deprivation, poverty, and environmental degradation. And those problems are set to get worse. Over the last few years, alone. We've had accounting scandals, market manipulations, we've had the LIBOR scandal, we've had payments protection insurance mis-selling, derivatives mis-selling, we've had tax scandals, we're having the horse meat scandal, we've had the Gulf of Mexico environmental disaster, we've had Fukushima. And all of those problems are perceived to have particular underlying problems. And each of them is perceived to require a specific solution. I will answer that the problems are not specific and the required solutions are not individual. There's a common problem and a common required set of solutions. The problem is the corporation, and the solution is to fix it and not everything else around it. Underlying the corporation is a concept of an institution that acts as a production function, linking together inputs of materials, labor, capital, to produce outputs of goods and services, or in a legal context as a nexus of contracts, or sociologically, as a social construct that reduces the costs of transacting in the market. It exists to serve one particular interest group in society, its owners, its shareholders. And the directors of companies owe its shareholders particular fiduciary responsibilities. And when those interests are not aligned with our social interests, we regulate the corporation more. And if necessary, we nationalize it. And where it fails more, we regulate and nationalize more. And where there is government failure and regulatory failure, then we privatize and we deregulate. And that notion of corporations being shareholder-oriented and regulated and nationalized as necessary or deregulated and privatized is a widely accepted consensus. It's the basis of national and international policies around the world. And it's fundamentally wrong. The reason it's wrong is that the notion of the corporation that I just described is a misconception. It is not just a production function, or a nexus of contracts, or a social construct. It does not exist primarily to further the interests of its shareholders. It exists to make things, to do things, to do services for the good of us, its employees, its customers, as well as its shareholders, creditors, and communities. But increasingly, this Alice in Wonderland has become a Frankenstein in Transylvania. Because this institution has been hijacked by the interests of one group, its shareholders. And not only has it been hijacked by its shareholders, it's been hijacked by increasingly short-term shareholders. 70 years ago, the average holding period of shares was eight years. 30 years ago, it was four years. Now, 
it's a matter of a few months and in the case of many investors, institutional investors, matters of hours, seconds, nanoseconds. It wasn't always like this. Indeed, the corporation was established by royal charter with a public purpose to undertake voyages of discovery, to open up trading around the world. Then it was established to build railways and canals. It then became privately incorporated in the form of family-owned firms, which were held for long periods of time. And over time, they gave way to institutions that initially held shares, as I described, for long periods of time, but now increasingly short periods of time. And the effect of this is devastating. And to deal with these problems, we have used just one form of intervention, regulation. A week ago, in the financial services industry, we heard how there is going to be intensive regulation of the banking system. All aspects of banking are going to be regulated going forward. What's going to be the consequence? The consequence is going to be that banks are going to do less of those things that we want them to do, which are regulated, like lending, and more of the things that are unregulated that we don't want them to do, like derivative. They're going to do more overseas and less in the UK. And this is happening because we believe that the only possible way of instilling a notion of trust and responsibility in these institutions is to regulate them. But far from promoting ethical compliance, what it does is to encourage instrumental avoidance. We have to solve the problem. The problem is the corporation, and we have to fix the corporation. We want to have corporations that have a long-term interest in their development and in the contributions that they can make to us as various parties and participants in them. But it is quite absurd to say that shareholders who are holding shares for a matter of hours or seconds or nanoseconds should, during those periods, have the same rights and control over the corporation as shareholders who are committed to holding for years and decades. It used to be the case that shareholdings earned votes on the basis of one person, one vote. It was then realized that, well, actually, that's not terribly fair, that if you invest a lot in a company, equality of treatment would suggest that you should have one share, one vote. So we move from one person, one vote, to one share, one vote. What that fails to recognize is that that is entirely inequitable. Because someone who is holding their shares for a period of 10 years is clearly making a far greater commitment than someone who is only holding their shares for a matter of hours or days. And yet, the notion of voting control does not reflect commitment. That is by no means everywhere the case. Indeed. In most corporations, in most countries, there is a notion of a dual-class shares by which some shares are widely traded with few voting rights associated with them, whereas other shares have substantial voting rights associated with them and are held by long-term shareholders. And that's a critical distinction because it allows, on the one hand, companies to raise equity capital from those who do not want to commit to the long term, but at the same time, to ensure that it is the long-term committed shareholders who have the ultimate control. Ownership is critical, but it is not sufficient on its own. We also need to have much greater clarity about what the values of the corporation are. What does it stand for? In whose interest is it operating? In a survey that was recently done of middle management of corporations, 
in five countries, the UK, the US, France, Germany, and Japan, those middle managements were asked, do you think that your company primarily has the shareholder interest or broader stakeholder interest in mind? In 70% of UK and US companies, the middle management said, we believe it is a shareholder solely oriented company. In France and Germany, 20%. In Japan, 3%. So in the same survey, they were asked, supposing your company gets into financial difficulty, what do you think your company would do? Would it cut its dividends to its shareholders or lay off employees? In 90% of the UK and the US corporations, the middle management said, we believe our corporation would lay off its employees. In 40% of the French and German companies, they gave that response. And in just 3% of the Japanese companies, they thought that they would lay off employees as against cut their dividends. It is perfectly conceivable that corporations as stock-listed corporations on stock exchanges can have interests other than those of their shareholders at mine. One of the most interesting elements of corporations is the observation that some of the most successful corporations in the world are what are termed industrial foundations. Companies like Carlsberg, the brewery, Robert Bosch, the automotive components company, Tata, the conglomerate, Vilux, the windows manufacturer, Bertelsmann, the media company. Those are all examples of companies that have foundations as their owners, and in many cases, foundations that give their profits not to shareholders but to charities. But in particular, those foundations have the responsibility to ensure that the corporation upholds its principles and values. They are not there to manage the corporation. And by being an independent board, they overcome the fundamental problem that exists in boards that those independent directors are inevitably conflicted between providing advice to the management and monitoring and supervision on behalf of the shareholders. I believe that what we need to do is to address the ownership, their values, their governance, their regulation, and their taxation. Corporations should take responsibility for their own conduct and the consequences of that conduct. They should be controlled by long-term committed owners. They should articulate clearly what they stand for, what their values are. They should have independent boards of directors. There should be much tougher enforcement of violations of public law, like bribery, corruption, market manipulation, market abuses, environmental damage. There should be better protection against systemic risks, financial systemic risks, and environmental systemic risks. But elsewhere, Regulation should be less intrusive, less meddling. We can use the tax system very effectively to align the interests of companies with broader social interests that go beyond those of just the stakeholders in the companies. We need to start to address this at the basic level of how we educate people who are going to go into business. And we need a reformation in the values that business leaders themselves apply, the roles and responsibilities that they have, as well as the rights and rewards that they have as both executives and shareholders. Morality in commercially oriented organizations may seem like an oxymoron, but it's not. It's not at all. A corporation is exceptionally well-placed to uphold commitments. Two corporations that illustrate this very well are Lehman Brothers and Barclays Bank. Not the Lehman Brothers and Barclays Bank of today, but the Lehman Brothers of the 19th century, 
when Mayor Lehman founded Lehman Brothers. And he used to, on a regular basis, take his children to the Mount Sinai Hospital to see the plight of the less well-off members of New York society. John Freem, the founder of Barclays, 320 years ago, wrote Scripture Instruction, a fundamental text of the Quakers for a hundred years. These highly principled founders of corporations have given way to dispersed owners and executives who have just one interest in mind, the return to their investments and the income that they're earning. Re-establishing trust in corporations is, I believe, the most important policy issue of this decade. Without it, economic policies will fail, financial systems will fail, and environmental degradation will deteriorate. With it, we can achieve far higher levels of economic prosperity and broader well-being than we've had to date. Because ultimately, there is a coincidence between the positive aspects of what corporations can do and the normative ones of what they should do. Because at the end of the day, a moral corporation is also a commercially successful corporation. And the competitiveness of nations depends on the moral fiber of its corporations. Thank you very much. Aren't you being a bit um, soft on us, really? Because I would have thought most of the people in this room have got pensions, life insurance schemes. We're all investors. We're all behind these short-term shareholders who are driving the behavior which you have uh, described in these terms. So isn't it really up to us to do something about this rather than hoping that firms will go through some kind of ethical renaissance? The answer is, Matthew, we can't. We're not currently empowered to have any influence on these institutions. We as individuals have very little authority or control. Now, one of the things that I'm very interested in doing as part of this project is to think about how can we essentially empower people to have more of an influence over corporations. And furthermore, there is a lot of potential that technology allows for us to think about not relying on either regulators or financial intermediaries to act on our behalf because we can essentially have various forms of participation through electronic voting mechanisms, as well as what currently discourages most people from doing anything at the moment, and that is to have to go along to a shareholder meeting. If the long-term determinants for a company's success include it behaving in a reasonable and ethical way, this ought to be reflected in its short-term value. Because if I buy something which I know in 10 years' time is going to fall apart, I won't pay as much for it as I will for something which I think in 10 years' time is still going to be going strong. What is going wrong in the middle of that? The thing that's going wrong is that what that does not take account of is that if there is a change in the shielding in the middle of a 10-year period during which a company is undertaking an investment, there can be a dramatic shift in the policy interests that the shareholders have. You cannot credibly commit because you know that you can't get your shareholders to credibly commit. And currently, there's no real independence between what the board of a company can do and what the shareholders want it to do. That's the ultimate problem. And so you cannot have a long-term investment commitment problem. Can I ask you to thank Colin Mayer?